So today's masterclass is with Vladimir Fung, um, somebody that I know many of you are familiar with and maybe most well known for being the youngest winner of the Tchaikovsky competition. So we are so excited to have him here tonight. Um, if you are able, as always, please turn on your camera so that we can have a little bit more of an interactive experience. Um, we have three cellists performing tonight. If anybody wants to check out the program, I have dropped it in the general channel in Slack. Um, and if everybody could just unmute and give Vladimir a really warm welcome, that would be great. Thank you. Sorry. Had to let the cat out. Oh, sorry. <laughs> And we'll be starting with Peter. Hi. Hi. Nice Hi. to meet you. What? Sorry. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So you'll be playing uh, the fifth suite, the Prelude in Allemande. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Whenever you're ready. Thank you. 
performance wonderful um, <clears throat> many very nice things and um, uh, it's it was really um, sad it was really satisfying to hear some of these uh, ideas you had about particular moments um, uh, chords that you felt strongly about because you know in the end um, 
it's all about the moments, you know. And uh, if you can, if you love the moments enough, and you bring them out, then that's what the audience really remembers. So uh, that, that was wonderful. Um, so you know, while you were playing, I was just thinking about something that um, that uh, actually was said by a colleague of mine in studio class um, a couple of years ago. Uh, another cellist was playing some Bach arrangement. It wasn't from the suites, but they were playing um, some Bach arrangement. Uh, and he said something quite interesting because this person who was playing in the class was playing uh, very intensely with like a lot of intense emotional connection to the music. You know, like very deep in the sound. And I I'm not saying this doesn't have anything really to do with the way that you played it um, because she was playing it in a completely different it was a completely different piece and a completely different style of playing. But anyway, she was playing it with, with a lot of like romantic kind of uh, intensity. And uh, this, this other person in the class who was listening, he said um, that he, he gave her a phenomenal comment, which was that she had to distinguish between, um, I think what he said, it was something like the carnal passion and the secular, uh, sorry, the, the, the secular passion and the uh, divine passion. That's what it was. Um, and I thought that was really, really intelligent uh, of an observation because I think ultimately Bach doesn't really have much secular passion. Um, you know, as much as people play it like it does uh, <laughs> often. Uh, but the, the, the beauty of Bach is very similar in a way to the beauty of like a mathematical equation, you know, sort of in its purity, in its architecture. Uh, in its logic. And I think the greatest interpretations of Bach, in, in my opinion, uh, they always speak to the, the, the intellect, but it, it, they speak to the intellect in a divine way. You know, like things like, you know, things that we can comprehend, but only begin to comprehend as human beings, right? So like, for example, for Bach, it was the concept of, you know, the, divin the divine, you know, divinity, human beings can get close, they can uh, have contact with it, like through music, for example, but they can never achieve the beauty of divinity, right? Um, so uh, anyway, that whole spiel is just to say that for me, Bach has to be interpreted in a very mathematical way as the, as the, as the performer. And that's not to say that, of course, you, you, don't, you, you don't like suppress your emotions, right? But that means that first and foremost, when you're analyzing the score, uh, figuring out how to play it, um, what to, what decisions to make, for example, about uh, the rhythm. Um, it has to be coming from a place of architectural awareness. Essentially, like, you should first appeal to the intellect and then appeal to the heart, you know. Whereas, you know, like, a lot of music, you, you definitely want to, like, the El Garcello Concerto or whatever, definitely you don't want to appeal to the intellect uh, <laughs> there. So, anyway... Um, that was all very abstract what I just said, but I want to get like more specific into it because uh, one of the big things that I think is related to this idea is the rhythm. Because for me, the rhythm in, in box music is something divine. It's something that's unchanging, kind of like the movement of heavenly bodies. You know, it's like nothing a human being can do, well, at least yet, uh, will change the fact that the earth is revolving around the sun at the rate that it is, right? Um, and I think that 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 fact, that sort of, again, it's sort of like this appeal to a larger force, that is what the rhythm is in box music. So sort of uh, having like a, this kind of profound respect for it. And that's not to say that you have to play everything in time, but I think that is to say that there is a regularity to the music that can experience flexibility within on the smaller scale but not on a larger scale because on a larger scale you know just like you know we can have a lot of freedom about what we do during the day but ultimately when we wake up the next morning the sun is still going to rise right it's that it's, 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 it's the same kind of thing you know you just want to feel the larger the larger routine the larger um regularity of the meter um so uh for me, the, the first way to do that is just to look at the bars, because the bars are, you know, there's a reason why Bach chose to write the music in the, the meter that he did. 
And I think that the bars are pretty much the most important unit. And then, of course, then you look at the phrases, right? Four-bar phrases or whatever, uh, eight-bar phrases. Um, so anyway, all that being said, uh, why don't we go back... Uh, actually, why don't we start with the Alamand? Because I thought that this was more... Uh, of an, uh, this is more of a point of uh, interest in the Alamand. Um, so, one 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 example is uh, you know, you have these yam ta da da di ba bim ba ba. That would be like the pedantic interpretation of the rhythm, right? And of course, you can have yam ta da da da, or you go yam ta di da da. You know, all sorts of different possibilities about how to. How to frame it, but the thing that stays the same is the fact that you have yam, yam, ba bam. Right, those two notes are constant, and then whatever happens in the middle is the same. So that that's really important, I think, to have as a as a baseline for the um, for the experience uh, of the of the music throughout. So um, one thing that I felt in general was sometimes when you ach achieved a cadence, for example. Uh, It was very nice, again, the, the, the closure that you felt there. But I think you cannot stop the music. That's one of the, the difficult things about Bach is that every beginning, every end is also a beginning. So to feel the duality of that. Um, do you want to just try the beginning again of the Alamand? Nice. Okay, so great. Couple observations that I have. One is that uh, I'm just telling you my experience as a listener because, um, again, you it's again appealing to the rational in the music, right? You want to make sure that whatever you're communicating through it is intelligible to someone um, who is not a musician, right? Someone who doesn't understand the difference between a sixteenth and an eighth, right? They should still be able to feel it intuitively. Um, I did not understand exactly the rhythm that you were doing in the, in the first two bars. I started to understand it in the third and fourth bar. And the fourth bar in particular was very good. But I want to feel at the beginning that I really understand the relationship between yum, ba bum, ba bum, and yum, ta di da dum, ta di. It should really feel very regular. So one question that you have to ponder all throughout this movement is what are you going to do with the chords? Are you going to feel from the bottom or are you going to feel from the top or and then especially it becomes a point of great interest when you have a if you want to feel paradim or tayam that influences the way that you have to feel the rhythm before, right? And I think it's not so much about what you do, it's about how clear you make what you do. Um, so in other words, uh, it, it's like, you know, write a beautiful geometric proof, make it, um, make there, have no, no flaws in, in, your, in, your, in your reasoning. You know what I mean? Like you want it to be extremely clear to me uh, as, you know, just a, a music lover, someone who doesn't know anything. I'm just loving the music, right? I want to know exactly what I'm getting myself into, what the phrase length is. Uh, do you want to try the beginning again? Another thing to, to think about um, is that you don't... Because, the, um, oh, can you hear me? No. Oops. Can you hear me now? Sorry, I got a message. My internet was unstable. Um, Peter, can you hear me? Because I can hear you, Vladimir, so I'm not sure. Yes, I can hear you. But okay, can you, can you try again? You just frozen. Okay, is it back? Okay, okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, you could... Uh, uh, 
Some somehow you can you can create the illusion of continuity in the sound with the right type of release. Of course, you don't have to do that. Again, it's not it's not about what you have or have to or don't have to do. Uh, it's about finding a way to communicate the music uh, effectively, make it clear to the listener what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Sorry to stop you, but that, that was already significantly better. I really understood the rhythm more. Um, just two small things. One, the very first chord, I still am not certain as a listener, not as a cellist, as just a, a music lover, uh, whether you're trying to make the beat the bottom note or the top. So whatever you do next, make it more clear. And the other thing is that bowing wise, uh, you seem to be getting a little bit stuck in the upper half. Uh, if you want to connect, which it seems like you do, uh, you might want to consider being on an up there and then so you can get back to the frog. So you can hook down, down, up, down, up, maybe. Very good. Beginning was much better. First two bars was like much better. Uh, only thing is, I'm I'm just not convinced by your bowing. It seems like you're very you're struggling it there at the tip. So I would just find find a way to fix fix that. Um, I mean, not not for for your own sake, but also for the music's sake, because the more comfortable we are, the better we sound in general. Uh, good. Now a couple other things that I don't fully I'm not convinced yet by right. So one of them is. Um, here, the time you're taking there, there are two reasons why I'm not convinced. One is that 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 is a fourth beat, right? A fourth beat typically, um, in Bach at least, is a beat that has a lot of uh, leading energy, right? It's it's leading to the the downbeat, which is stronger. And secondly, um, rhythmically, there's been this motive established of yum, ba bam, ba bam right as as the second half of the bar so if you can preserve that that would be ideal i think i think and um and i know maybe this is you know this is your thing i'll tell you a funny story uh well i think when i was 10 um uh i was playing the hide and see major cello concerto i was at a summer camp um in upstate new york and um uh, you know the the like the, the the normal cadenza that goes uh, at the end of it is like right that's like the stock cadenza and at the time I was really intent on doing uh, 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 I was doing this massive slide and my teacher was like oh my god that's just so tasteless and I was like okay fine you know I'll do and then when the performance came I did the slide anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, anyway, the, the point of that story is that uh, sometimes you just love things a little too much to let them go. And uh, for you, that might be bar five. But I would, I would encourage you to think uh, maybe finding a way to, to just do it with color. Because I know you find that, I can tell by the way you play it, that you love that C minor chord, is the establishing quality of it. But remember, it's both an end and a beginning. So... Um, if it's only an end, then people will be left wondering uh, what just happened there, right? What, what was, the, the piece has only been going on for 15 seconds, right? So anyway, uh, but again, story in point, uh, if you want, really want to do it, there's nothing I can do. Uh, and you should do it then. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, yeah, so try maybe this one. 
Try to feel the dom, ti dom, bobby. Try to feel that the trill is not actually influencing the quality of the rhythm. things um yeah excellent so um what was i gonna say oh uh, yeah so a couple things one is that when you have um uh, here make sure because again you're you're doing the, the rule of three right in western music that often think oftentimes things happen three times and the third time is the special one um, if you change the quality, the fundamental rhythmic quality, the third time, people don't, the listener doesn't feel that relationship. So you need to remember, ta, di di da di da, da di da di da 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 di. So I wouldn't mess with the rhythm too much there. Uh, it, you could do a little bit, but I would do it on the back end. So ya, ta da da da. But you, you shouldn't do da da di da da. You shouldn't, you know, romanticize it on the front end of that beat. Um, yeah, good. And the only other thing is that before that, um, uh, I think it's just in general, I would experiment more with hooking because it feels like you're getting stuck in the upper half of the bow, just down, up, down. So if you do down, down, up, up. And the other benefit of doing that is that um, it gives more dimension to the sound because inherently an up and down bow have a slightly different quality. Uh, so if one, if this, if it's the same rhythm, bomb, Ba -bum, ba -bum, then the second one will feel different inherently. Um, yeah, very good though. Um, okay, why don't you just finish off the first half, maybe from from there. So for example there, why not just hook? So much easier, I think, yeah. Uh, so just think about that a lot, the bowing um, uh, throughout this movement. That was very good, but again, same thing. Don't let the trill, uh, sorry, sorry, here. Don't let the trill let you linger, it should be, it should continue to have the forward motion, uh, the rest of the music. Um, one exercise that I really like for feeling pulse is to practice counting aloud uh, when you play, which is actually quite difficult depending on the, t the, the piece. But um, really just counting, you know, uh, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. It really, it, first of all, it you're you kind of become your own conductor because you have to suddenly make these decisions like, okay, am I going to say one or am I going to say one, right? So you have to make those decisions about the the first beat, what, the chords. You know, are you going to land on the beat or are you going to um, uh, play the the low note on the beat? Anyway, um, that's just one practice technique that would work. So anyway, already much improved. So keep going in that direction with this movement and. Uh, I would really think about the bowing because I think that will solve a lot of problems for you. Uh, it will give you more flexibility if you hook more often. Okay, so let's talk about the first movement, the prelude. Um, so I just um, so actually the, the 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 beginning of the prelude, I would think of similarly to the way that we just talked about the alamand. 
I would th of course, it's a slightly different mood, a slightly different overall approach, and I think there is more freedom rhythmically, which you, you definitely did take advantage of in a very nice way. Um, but overall, you have all these, you know, bum, ba bum, ba bum. You have these same kinds of rhythms, like it's like a French overture rhythm, basically. So um, I would again think about the bowing, think about uh, the preserving rhythmic units if they're symmetrical. Uh, preserving their qualities um, but anyway so the only thing that uh, that um, I wanted to talk about here was just the, the the one spot where you can go a little more crazy is the cadenza I think that this is pretty much just a written out cadenza so if you wanted to really go quickly and kind of feel it flowing flowing uh, that I think that would be fine um, and uh, you can, I mean, all sorts of things you can do, but you know, like a... Yeah, and anyway, so there actually, the transition, I liked the fact that you thought of that Again, it's it's the same the same concept that it's both a beginning and an end, right? So it's yum, bum, bum. But it's also da, um, di, ti. So t I think a nice compromise between what you want and what you did would be to just release a little bit more, but to have the same feeling of the pulse. So. Uh, because if you. Uh, then it really feels like it, the music never ended. But it did end actually, right? It both ended and began. So, <laughs> uh, do you want to just try that transition once? Yes. Yeah, try the cadenza. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, very nice end of the first part. Very good. So now in this section, a um, uh, couple things. One is that, um, you know, obviously Bach was a keyboard player, right? And these these suites are, are, are I think they're written sort of, in the, in the perspective of someone who is a keyboard player, if you, if you know what I mean. And by that, I don't necessarily mean that they're not idiomatic for the instrument, because they actually sit well, pretty well in the hand in general. Um, it's that the qualities that the music demands and the way that the counterpoint is structured is very uh, dependent on the clarity and cleanliness of the playing. And one of the things that is just inherent about playing a stringed instrument is that the sound is messier than something like the car harpsichord, right? It's messier in the sense that anytime we produce a sound, there's just a lot more variables about what could happen, right? Both at the beginning uh, and at the end of the note, right? Uh, in, the, in the harpsichord, first of all, there's only one type of attack and uh, there is no variability in the end uh, of, of the sound, right? So I think we can kind of learn from that as string players have that sort of approach to think of 
primarily having the most important part of the note be the beginning of the note. Uh, and in, especially in a very contrapuntal passage uh, like, um, like the entirety of this fugue, um, to really have a close ear attached to what's happening in between the notes. Because typically things that happen in between the notes for us are kind of unwanted in this type of music, right? So like, for example, the sound of a shift, right? Or um, the sound of a string crossing. Those are things that are, are natural to our instrument, but are not natural to what this music needs. If you see what I mean. Uh, yeah, so in other words, I would just, that's basically kind of a long-winded way of saying that I would practice this a lot slowly and try to focus on being very clean in all of your shifts, all of your string crossings, every transition that happens physically in terms of the execution. Uh, so that's the first thing. Now, the second thing is that I can see already that you're doing, I can see and hear already that you're doing a lot of great things with the voicing. Um, and I just wanted to introduce to you one way that, if you're not aware of it already, one way that I've, I've thought about voicing which I actually learned from a theory teacher. Um, and it's the most useful thing I ever learned in theory class. Um, it was, we actually, we're actually, we're using it to study box music, not, not this piece or anything, but uh, it's remarkable how well it works with, with, uh, with box music. The basic idea is just that you wanna follow every contrapuntal line. And the rule is that um, a voice can only be resolved by step, never by leap. Not even by harmonic, not even by harmonic leap. Like uh, you can't even like leap an octave. That means it's a different voice. And as simple as that sounds, it actually opens up a lot of interesting interpretive ideas. And I just wanted to point a couple of them out at the end on the last page uh, of this because as as the music gets more and more intense, what happens is typically with Bach, he creates more voices and leaves more of them unresolved until the climax where all of them suddenly resolve at once. And that's what's most fascinating about the music. Again, he was such an architect and a mathematician. He was seeing all these different things occur at the same time. And when you start to, as a performer, when you are trying to juggle all those things, of course, it's not really possible, right? But the knowledge of them can help us make subtle interpretive decisions about, okay, this note needs to be a little louder, or this entrance needs to be a little more clear, right? Um, so on the last page, like a good example is um, uh, that, uh, here we go. Uh, so we have um, here, uh, this is, is one voice, right? And now that G is left hanging, G, the G is still left hanging because it hasn't been resolved by step, right? And now the E flat is hanging. Uh, now you have these three notes all hanging unresolved. I mean, it just so happens that, that they are resonating in C minor, which is good. And then you have the da 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 And that note is not resolved until, right? And then, right? So in other words, you know, it's often, it's often possible to find, you know, for example, if you were doing different voice, right? I mean, you might think that way, but I think it's important to see the larger picture underneath. Typically, the bass line will give you the most information about what it is that you need to focus on, right? So in other words, what would that tell you? Well, for, for, for one, you know, you might want to play that extra resonantly. And then, right, you might want to think of those three notes, you know, as forming that chord, right? They're kind of picking up the loose ends of all this other stuff that's happened before. Anyway, it's just... Just a, one way to think about it, but if you go through the piece and you think about it that entire way, you'll be amazed the kinds of things you find. And it also it works for almost every movement in the box suites. Um, some really remarkable stuff. Um, are we out of time? We are just about out of time. Okay. Well, very nice to hear you, uh, Peter. So, uh, wonderful playing. Yeah. Thank you. Bravo. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So, uh, Brahms F, first movement? Yes. Nice.
Terrific. Beautiful performance. Um, really solid and um, very, very secure playing, too, which is really, I appreciate that a lot. Um, uh, and, and of course, um, also energetic, too, which is, you know, this piece absolutely needs um, a lot of love uh, in, in terms of... Uh, in terms of the, the you know the big heartedness uh, that you have to bring to it, it's such a joyous and, and wonderful um, piece. Funny to hear also without piano. Um, oh yeah. Sure. <laughs> but uh, but I actually just heard it live, um, played by uh, Pablo Ferrandez. Uh, oh, yeah. Familiar with him? Um, like a few weeks ago, so it's still kind of in my ear uh, with the piano. Uh, yeah. So wonderful. So I think um, you know. Really, the, the big thing to discuss in this piece, so different from the Bach, I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no divine passion here, really. It's, <laughs> oh, it's raw passion. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's all carnal passion. I, I love it. Um, you know, actually, there's a funny story I read on Wikipedia, but it was, it was, um, it was, quote, it was a quotation from a reliable source. So <laughs> I know that it was, someone didn't just make it up. Um, that Dvorak wrote in some letter because you know Dvorak and Brahms knew each other and Brahms was um, supporter of Dvorak's and um, Dvorak was a very devout Catholic and Brahms was I guess you could say Christian but uh, he wasn't devout right and uh, you know and I think actually that quality kind of comes through in his music um, but that's all there's a whole other story but uh, uh, Dvorak wrote in this letter to his friend like, oh, Brahms, you know, such a such an incredible composer, wonderful man, but he believes in nothing or something, you know, kind of in disbelief at his, I guess, what Dvorak perceived to be his agnosticism, personal agnosticism. Um, yeah, but anyway, uh, you know, what, one of my former teachers told me something really interesting, which I guess has almost no basis in actual fact, but is still really interesting and thought-provoking provoking to think about which is that you know how brahms loves the two against three like it's in like practically every single piece he wrote um including this one uh especially in this in the the second and third movements um for this according to this teacher that i had who was teaching me chamber music um the 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 duple is supposed to represent the duality of man and woman and the trip triple is supposed to represent the holy trinity Right, so the constant, by constantly pitting them against one another, Brahms was actually sort of, in a way, it's like a dialectic. You know, he's trying to, to understand the relationship between our worldly existence and the greater divinity that we don't, we can't perceive, right? Or you know, we can only begin to perceive. Um, so I, I, I thought that that was really interesting, and that kind of informs the way that I think about a lot of, like, some of the most intense moments are like the, these two against three. Um, and um, it's just very interesting to think of it that way. It's this kind of it's this constant agnostic struggle, right? So again, going back, it's like the complete complete opposite of Bach, where you know Bach, you know, the starting point is like God is great, you know, and he wrote that at the end of all his manuscripts, right? Um, or for the to the glory of God, that's what he wrote. Um, but anyway, so yeah, this is all about the the carnal. It's about the flesh. So um, speaking of flesh, I think that um, in general, what I would say about these forte ba -ba is that if you can just try to have a little bit more meat in the sound both in terms of the initial attack and the follow-through in the sostenuto of of the of the long note um and actually i thought you did a lot of really excellent stuff dynamically like especially at the beginning of the development where you were, uh you know where the notes get longer like that was excellent i think at the beginning you can find that same kind of detail so you know you have a it's really all about how you release too, you know, because you can. I remember, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I saw one performance of this where, um, I think it was a recording on the internet where the cellist, uh, I'm not going to name them, uh, just uh, went all, all the time. Like no, uh, no change and no whip. Right, no growth, right? And more importantly, the... It was always such a clean ending. You know, it's... Dumb. I'm done, right? But <laughs> but I think, if anything, the, the rest 
is an interruption of the sound, you know? It's not that the sound ends to make way for the rest, you know? It, so, kind of, you can feel, really feel that the, the, the rest is, is, it's like, ah, oh, you know, I wish I didn't have to play that rest, right? So the way that you, you really release has a lot of energy. And in terms of the meat at the beginning for the attack, I find that it's, you know, a lot, it has to do with the fingers, but of course also has to do with the relationship of one's shoulder, sort of feeling that the entire body is put into the sound. To put a lot of, you know, torso action and everything. So you want to give that a shot at the beginning? Yeah, sure. Very good, very good. Excellent, very good. So one thing that I would encourage you to try, just for now, you know, you, of course you don't have to do it ultimately, is try starting from the string. So right now I see kind of, you're getting this kind of attack because you're approaching the string kind of subtly. But if you start from the string already having a lot of grip, then you can have that click right at the beginning of the note. You know what I mean? And if, if you start also even closer to the absolute frog. Oh, you know what's interesting? That same performance uh, that, that they did, they did the rhythm very pedantically. They always go, because they're counting. Da, 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 da. But I think you have pretty much have to double dot this, you know, also the, the the, the, the music is telling you more than the, than, than the, the quality of the music is telling you more than the piano, um, all this intensity underneath, yeah, right? Mixed up with the... Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. It's so rhythmically passionate. So anyway, uh, give that a shot, kind of having a little, starting from the string already deep in it and gripping. At the very least, even if you don't end up doing it that way, it's good to have that technique in your vocabulary of, of the bow. Yeah, there's so. always a fine line between like that and then scratchiness. Yes, there, there, there is a fine line. But you know, you know what's funny is that I think you'll be surprised. Often our own perceptions of whether we sound ugly are uh, pretty skewed toward not doing enough, especially if we're sensitive, you know. Um, it, it, it's funny. I was actually recently someone played the Rococo variations for me. And you have you played it? Uh, no, not yet. Oh, okay. So, you know, the first variation uh, is this, it's very nice, you know. And they were playing like, I mean, they were playing really well, but it was like, like pianissimo, dolcissimo, you know, uh, <laughs> like uh, far away, like kind of. And I was like, okay, I want you to try once playing it like fortissimo, like ugly fortissimo, like just show me, like, show me what you got. And then they played it like, and I was like thinking inside, like, that's your fortissimo? That sounds like mezzo piano. And I was like, and I told them, just do that. Do that fortissimo. That's great. You know, so they, they had a very sort of intense relationship with worrying about sounding too ugly. And that caused their whole playing to kind of uh, close up a bit, right? And I think that in a way, having that sensitivity is a great gift because it's much easier to desensitize yourself than to sensitize yourself if you find no problem with ugly sounds and then someone asks you to play beautifully and you just can't do it. Uh, so anyway, I think you have the good type of issue at the moment, which is that I think you can allow yourself to play a little bit more roughly and, uh, you know, experiment. You never, you know, I, I always like to think that, so there are a lot of great analogies between cooking and playing a musical instrument, right? Like, for example, uh, you know, like like one of Perlman's favorites is like that the sound has to be like hot fudge, or like vibrato is like the cornstarch in Chinese food. If it's just right, you don't notice it. Stuff like that, you know, it's great analogies. Um, but one big difference between cooking and uh, playing the uh, playing a musical instrument is that in cooking, if you add too much, like add too much salt, you can't take it away, right? Uh, you have to always be on the conservative side and then add until you just have the right amount. But that doesn't work on the cello. You have to do the opposite. You have to go all out. You have to go all in and then pair back. You never know what's enough until you know it's too much. 
basically. Yeah, I, know. I, I always feel that when I'm playing. Yeah, so I would encourage you, especially in the privacy of your own practice room, just to kind of be rough and like, uh, you know, it's a, it's a zero judgment zone, right? So like experiment with things that are outside of your comfort, like, like playing ugly, you know, uh, having a bit of a wild vibrato, like, you know, try to like imitate someone who's playing you really don't like. And you'll be surprised, you know, you might actually have something to learn from their style. <laughs> I found that, I found that in my, in my practicing. Anyway, uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. So yeah, like for example, show me my Caesar Brado or, or you know, uh, you know, Lynn Harrell, may he rest in peace, what a wonderful cellist. He played very ugly, especially toward the end of his, his life often, you know, so emulate that a little bit. <laughs> right. <laughs> With a lot of scratch, like all, like all projection, no sound. <laughs> so anyway, uh, just give that a shot at the beginning again with the uh, thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Beautiful. I thought that was already a big difference. And yeah, by the way, it sound. barely came through. Like that didn't sound ugly even in the slightest. So you can do way more than that. Yeah, At least when you hear it didn't sound ugly. Yeah, right. So challenge yourself when you're, when you're practicing. Make it ugly for yourself. And then ask someone else to listen and ask them, is it ugly? If they say, yes, it is, then, then you can think about pairing back. But you'd be surprised. They might say, oh, yeah, it sounds fine. You know, so. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's really true. It's really true. And that also applies to a lot of mistakes. You know, when we make mistakes, it often seems like a much bigger deal to us than it actually is. So that's why it's important just to kind of let things go very easily. Um, all right. Now, the other thing is that, you know, I would, I, your bowing is fancy and I appreciate it on an intellectual level, but remember, this isn't Bach. I would... <laughs> I would do the retake every time because you want to build the intensity. You know, it's like yeah. one of my favorite performances of this piece is Dupre and Barenboim. I mean, it's just oh, so yeah. fiery. And I just love the way she, especially I love the fingering she does here. I think she does just uh, open A and then. It's so nice, that open A. I love that open A. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so think about um, growing, each one growing incrementally. And then when you get up here, once you, once you nail the shift, which you will, uh, crescendo a lot more and emulate my ski's vibrato a bit uh, because it sounds a little timid up at, up at the top. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just, yeah the, the vibrato growth is always a challenge in this. Yeah, so, you know, just go for it, especially up there. Uh, even a very small amount of extra will translate to a lot in the sound because, you know, the space is smaller, right? Just try the end there. Yeah, good. You also might want to consider, again, you don't have to do it now, but... Uh, I, don't, I can't remember whether I do thumb there or not. But anyway, to do up. And then, because again, you need a lot of sound. I think you need a lot of sound. So, a piano underneath you is loud as heck. So, anyway, okay, should we go on? Um, here's, here's another Maisky moment, really. Really. Go all out with the vibrato. Good. Wonderful. By the way, I wanted to commend you on something which I think is actually really rare among cellists, uh, is that when you play up high, you manage to keep your cool up here in the neck. I don't know if that's something you work on a lot, but... Oh, it's I, yeah, the, the past year with my teacher has been encouraging me to... Yeah, because sometimes I tend to go up, but, but yeah, I've been, I've been trying to keep that in check. 
but that that's that's pretty remarkable you know that the fact that that you don't you don't like go down and look too much you know that's really great so i yeah because I, I, I always used to do that right right I, well, I just, it, it doesn't really make that big of a difference exactly double stops but yeah I miss it. it's okay yeah, exactly. So yeah, kudos to you. Um, that's, that's quite difficult to achieve. Um, so uh, in these passages, which th the whole thing was really great, what you did uh, here. I think as you go up higher, I would focus more on being more sostenuto. You want to play really legato. Because right now I still hear a little bit of... Especially... I hear kind of... A lot of spaces, a lot of portato. I, uh, if you can... Really play like kind of Casal style sustenuto, where you really feel the the line of the music. The yeah, singing. Probably with my, my right arm angle. Sorry? Probably with my right arm angle that it's sounding like that. Yeah, yeah. So you, you want to. Um, I think it's also it also has to do with feeling the sound production coming from here, because the more that you feel it locally, the the easier it is to to manipulate in the fingers and lose the legato. But if you feel the larger motion. <laughs> You know what I always say about legato is that it's actually weird because most people have this problem where, like, if you ask them to play, like, really legato, um, like, for example, you know, they'll play kind of, you know, like all this portato, right? But that's actually a much harder stroke because one of the first strokes we learn on the cello is just playing a simple bow, right? All you have to do is do that. Of course, not at the same exact speed, but if you just play as if you're playing an open string, there's going to be no hitches, right? It's just that we're influenced by what we're doing in the left hand. We want to keep it clean or whatever. But the singing quality in the sound, especially... I think it's bigger than... If you, can, if you can really keep the sound singing, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, because sometimes I kind of accent certain notes with vibrato. You know, I think that's a lesser crime, to be honest, than having le less legato. For me, legato... Actually, you bring up a good point, because I think that every moment in a piece of music has, like, one most important thing. You know what I mean? Like, And at the beginning, like, I think the most important thing is, like, the openness, the exuberance, right? And then here, I think the most important thing is kind of the sing-songiness, right? And so you have to identify the most important element and then, and then practice toward that, right? So even sometimes at the expense of other things, you know, intonation or, you know, whatever. Um, of course, you want it all, but, you know, you can't have it all in life. You, so it's better to have the best thing than to have everything. <laughs> oh, definitely. So anyway, um, so anyway, think about that. Uh, let's move on a bit. Um, we've got a lot, of, lot to cover. Um, ah, so this was very good. Uh, one thing to think about, you know, Often when we learn this piece, we think of things in terms of our own part. Um, and in this bar, when I, whenever I, when I first learned it, I always used to think of it like three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You know, that displacement. And the displacement is a huge part of Brahms' musical language. But, but that being said, um, I think the displacement uh, is best and most effective when it's felt at in great tension with the actual rhythm like do you do you know the um do you know the the second symphony oh, yeah. yeah yeah so so you know the 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 place in the like toward the end of the exposition of the first movement where like the the violins have like the yeah da -de -da. yeah yeah the violas have the the da -da -da -da. Yeah, exactly, in the da 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 di da da da, or whatever. I'm sorry, I don't have perfect pitch, so. But you know that whole thing is displaced one beat, right? And what bothers me so much is when conductors just kind of conduct it like, you know, they conduct it as if. But I think that you really have to challenge the violins to play da, or whatever. I forget exactly what the displacement is, but really to feel that they want to play toward the actual first beat, you know. So I think it's the same thing here, where you want to feel. Mm. Three, one, and then same thing here. Of course, you have the accent on the second beat, but I would practice a lot. One, two, one, two. You can, 
right? So da yum ba di dum di. Just like you have here, where you can finally really feel that rhythm, right? At the coda, right? So. Uh, of course, it's really hard, but I think even just feeling it, being aware of your own tendency, changes the way that the music feels, both to you and the world. So, anyway, that's just one small spiel about that. Uh, do you want to try that, actually? Yeah. Is that better? Or? Yeah, that, that was good. Only thing I'd be aware of is... um. The quality of the release, yum ti, you want it to still sing, uh, especially feel the, the lyrical quality, yum ti, even if it releases, have it sing. Sorry. Good. Uh, are you, you're not doing a harmonic, right? On the E? Yeah. No. Wow. Uh, well, in that case, you're, you're more ambitious than I am. <laughs> uh, I think that I just do the harmonic, and a lot of cellists I've seen just do the harmonic. So it's an option there for you. <laughs> but be ambitious. It's good to always be more ambitious and uh, see what happens. Um, nice. Um, OK, great. Uh, here, same, similar to the beginning, I just think you could have a little more meat in the sound. Kind of a, especially because this is a place where it's very easy to be completely overpowered by the piano. So you really need to fight your way through the texture. So I would, it would be quite strong. Better, yeah, much better. This, I think, could be uglier. Uh, like, really violent. It's kind of violent music there. Oh, yeah. yeah, just it's always hard not to hit other strings in, in those spots. It is. It, it absolutely is. But again, you can't have it all. If you want it to be the right character, sometimes you got to sacrifice the cleanliness, right? Yeah, and the thing is, it, it's not a big deal when you're with piano. It's really not. <laughs> I mean, it feels so different. It does. It does. Because when you play with piano, I'm sure you've had this experience, you have to really fight a lot more to make your part matter. You know what I mean? And that's also because of the way that pianists typically approach chamber music, where they feel that they're the center of the world. Uh, which, you know, in their defense, most of the great chamber music that involves piano was written by pianists. So, uh, you know, they have, they have a point. But anyway, uh, it's rare when you find a pianist who really prioritizes actually any, everything else that's going on. Those are really special pianists. But anyway, they're, they're quite, quite rare. Um, but anyway, so when, when, you're, <laughs> when you're playing with piano, yeah, you can let, you, you have to fight a little bit more. But um, it's actually one of the great challenges of practicing is, is, is finding the context of what you're practicing for. Like, for example, one of the things that I personally have struggled with the most is, you know, in a performance, a lot of things happen that you don't expect, right? And I'm sure you've had that experience that things just really feel different. Every shift feels a little bit harder. Every, uh, every rest feels a little bit more tense, right? Every uh, difficult section feels a little bit more chaotic, right? You know what I mean? So how do you practice for that? when you can't really replicate the experience of being in a performance in your practice room, right? And I think that's part of the issue. It's like you have to practice in ways that prepare you the best for the situation that you're actually practicing for. And another common thing is, you know, when people practice, again, like very pianissimo, they kind of play like, you know, if they would play this piece, again, like, like not that anyone would do that, but like zero attempt toward the forte and then they get into a hall with like 2,000 people and then they're like oh my god I have to project and they you know they haven't practiced projecting at all of course they're going to get tense and the performance isn't going to go well right so you want to practice being a lot more than you need to be in the practice room so that when you actually get into the situation where things are harder you can take it a step back 
and it will still be good. It will still be enough, right? Um, but if you only practice to where you're hoping to go, then when you get into the performance, when you get into a situation that's going to cause you anxiety and you take that step back, it won't be enough, right? So go to 150 so that when you go back, it's still 100. If you go to only 100 and you go back, you're at 50. It's no good. Anyway, that's just my overall, that's my overall uh, approach. Uh, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, especially in terms of, of contrast, you know, it's, it, it, you know, you always feel like you're not doing enough. Exactly, exactly. So do like 200%. Again, it was the same thing I was talking about with the, the do like 200, 300%. Really challenge yourself to go outside of what you feel is correct. And I think that will open up a lot of possibilities for you when you get to the, like the rehearsal with the piano or when you get to the concert. Uh, you'll have a lot, a lot wider range uh, to, to deal, to work with. Um, okay. Um, okay, wonderful. Let's just skip ahead a little bit because this is all pretty similar. Uh, so, let's just talk for a second. Oh, actually, why don't you play this passage? Um, uh, the... And again, my ski it up a little bit. Okay. Fantastic. That's great. That was nowhere near too much. Like, nowhere. Oh. Yeah. Was not too Show me too much. <laughs> that was still perfectly acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. At, the, at the beginning, it's always weird to, to like, you know, because you, you want to build, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. You want to build, right? So. Uh, one thing just very specific about this, I would have a little bit more core because you can create a, a softer sound with still a lot of core. So I would have kind of, and then I would grow by using more bow at the same pressure and contact. Kind of. Also, I would consider, that was really out of tune, sorry. I would consider um, playing it all on the A string. That might also help. Uh, yeah, my teacher said, it's just the, the first, well, I mean, especially the second shift, which is, you know, in, in performance, it's, you know. It is, but but again, everything's a compromise, right? You you lose something. So you either lose the accuracy or you, you lose the intention. And for me, the intention always trumps the accuracy. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, it should still be, I mean, you know, obviously the, the range that the C is on the D string doesn't project the best, but it could right. probably still be done. It can definitely be done. It, no, absolutely, it can be done. And, you know, I've done all sorts of fingerings that were really chicken. And, you know, I've tried to defend them. But I think, you know, also, you know, when we do those types of things, part of us kind of knows, like, you know, we're doing that to play it safe. You know, you know what I mean? So, oh, of course. Yeah, so <laughs> we can try to justify it as much as we want. But <laughs> ultimately, but anyway, playing in tune is very important. So don't, don't sacrifice that too often. Um, yeah, okay, last thing. Um, all this stuff, commendable. Again, very commendable how accurate you were. Um, in the middle section where it happens so much, I would... Again, I would even think about sacrificing a little bit of the rhythmic precision for more, for more intensity in the sound because ultimately this is just bubbling, right? It's like you're trying to create a texture that that's creating a lot of mystery, and then eventually when you get to the place that goes, um, oh, where is it? Uh, uh, here. There you have to become actually very lyrical. So that's another place where I would, again, sacrifice the rhythmic precision so you can play very lyrical. Sorry. I would really feel the... Feel the quality of the, the again, legato kind of, the legato within the, the tremolo. Uh, do you want to just try that right there? The feel the, the thread of the music grow. Better, better. One thing to think about would be growing toward the end 
and then not accenting, but rather continuing the crescendo. Sorry, I'm, I'm just wildly out of tune, but do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and again, you, you have to, again, it's one of those things you have to try with the piano because pff, it might not work at all, right? The pianist might not be able to follow you. But I, I like to think that actually when the musical intention is clear, it's easier to follow than when the rhythm is clear. Yeah, because I've given performances. Right, I've given performances where I've been like, you know, kind of like, like super, like, like super accurate. And then the pianist is like, is like I, I can't hear you at all, or they're coming in the wrong place. You know, so I, I think actually the solution is to play in sync with them musically, and then let whatever happens cellistically happen, whether it's good or not. Uh, but again, serve the higher purpose of the phrase. So, uh, last time, last time. Very nice. Yeah, wonderful. Excellent. Great, great. So think along those lines. Wonderful. Um, so are we just about out of time? Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Fantastic. Great to hear you. Thank you so much. This was great. Yeah, you're most welcome. It was a pleasure to meet you and to hear you. Yeah, my, my teacher says hi. Oh, wonderful. Well, say hello back for me. Will do. Yeah, I'm with, I'm with uh, Brian Meiker. Oh, no way. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, send my warmest regards and tell him that uh, we got to play chess sometime. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, all the all the best. Hi, Rachel. Hello. Hi, Esther. Hi. Uh, so, uh, are you going to play the Dvorak, Dvorak Silent Woods first? Uh, yes. Okay, and you would like to play both that and the Tchaikovsky? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, so you want to do twenty minutes on each? Okay. No oh, great. Go ahead. Thank you. 
Bravo. Wonderful. Beautiful. Beautiful. Fantastic. Very, very fine playing. Wonderful playing. Yeah. Have we met? Did we meet in L.A.? Or... Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Um, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. So, uh, really, really fantastic. You know, um, I mean, I don't really have much, much to add. Uh, the only thing that I would tell you um, is, uh, have you by any chance heard the uh, the original uh, two piano? Uh, sorry, not two piano. It's a four hands, four hands version. Very interesting. I would recommend. I recommend you check it out. Um, in fact, I performed this piece like a gazillion times before I even knew that it wasn't originally written for cello. Um, I mean, I think the cello version is better. Uh, and I think Dvorak also thought it was better, uh, but uh, <laughs> but the original is super interesting because so this piece basically it exists in three forms. It exists in the form with the two the, the the four hands, cello and piano, and cello and orchestra, and each form is actually kind of a different piece. And I think what you'll find when you listen to it with the two, the four hands version is that. Uh, uh, well, a couple things. One is that since the piano is incapable of sustaining uh, like a, a true legato line, the work has much more of a, a, a promenade kind of feel. Like it actually feels more like a stroll. You know, like for us cellists, you know, we hear like the Dupre recording and it's all like, you know, you know all like the, like every like connective issue between the notes is like from the bottom of her soul. But, you know, and that's phenomenal, of course, but you completely lose, in that case, you completely lose the sense that you're walking through the woods, right? And another thing that you lose in the arrangement here is that in the original two, two piano version, uh, sorry, how do I call it two pianos? Four hands. The original four hands version, um, uh, you have these huge uh, rolled chords. They're yum, they're yum, even at the very beginning. And it's very interesting to, to have that kind of texture. So anyway, I would just encourage you to give it, give it a listen. But uh, the point I wanted to make relative to that and this is that in this piece, in this rendition, cello and piano, you have to make a decision about whether you are going to be that kind of maple syrupy Dupre way, which it seemed like you were leaning more toward, or to bring some element of walking, of strolling, right? Because there are moments where you can. And also, I wanted to, to remark that your tempo was very good. It was not too slow. I just wanted to remark about that, yeah, because it was a very good tempo. And I think that some people, they take this too slow, you completely lose the sense that it's a journey that's physical, right? It's, it's not only a spiritual thing, because the rhythm is so important, the way that the piano just kind of, it's there for you, right? And, um, yeah, so and the other point I w wanted to make just in general is that whenever you have something expressive, like a, a big, like for example, when you get to the, this stuff, and you really go for it with the forte, it should be a great contrast to the beginning where you have uh, all this stuff. This is a crescendo, right? But this is just, it's only a crescendo to a sforzando, right? In the piano part. You don't even have it in the cello part, I think. So, it's just deep. It's just deep and it's not much in terms of time. It's more just color and intensity, right? Um, so there are a lot of interesting things you can do with the dynamics um, uh, throughout. And also there's some specifics. So why don't we, um, sorry, I'm just gonna pull up my score here. Um, uh, why don't you go from, uh, actually just go from the beginning. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just play a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
good. Very good. So a couple things. Very, very good. A um, couple things about the second phrase, starting in bar five. One is that um, you notice that there's no crescendo until the, the third bar of the phrase, despite the fact that, I guess, I think in the orchestration, it's like the clarinet or something, and the fact that the piano has these chords in the right hand that intensify. Actually, the last time I played this, which was pretty recently, uh, I had a big argument with my pianist about this because he wanted to crescendo there before it was written. And I just like implored him, don't crescendo. Eve, I know you have more notes, but I think it's much more interesting if uh, this bar is actually kind of a diminuendo. And then this is the low point so that you can really grow. And then to that point here, you, you have the pianissimo. I would try to avoid taking any time because, again, you're still... The piece is in its early stages. There's not much that's happened yet. I would just feel, okay, now we're in a different part of the woods, right? It's, crickets are a little bit quieter, right? When we're here... You want to just go right from there? Um... good that's another place i wouldn't do writ i think actually the diminuendo is more effective if you don't um especially because the next phrase the next four bars in my opinion my favorite four bars in the piece they're so flexible that you can you can then save the time for later um wonderful uh one last detail uh here you you observe this phenomenally how you have the diminuendo but i would feel still the next bar is also a wave right here Mezzo forte, piano, keep diminuendoing, now grow, don't grow too soon, and I think the forte becomes more dramatic if you, if you postpone it, allow the piano to, the piano to crescendo, crescendo a bit ahead of you, um, okay, last detail, uh, this bar, this is a huge crescendo, right? What's interesting is that the piano has a diminuendo molto from the downbeat, but the cello phrases to the middle of the bar. And I find that much more beautiful if the piano can join the cello there. So I would have, you can, you can talk with among yourselves, but if, if you can somehow. It's really, really nice if you can feel the, the beauty of that, uh, that middle of the bar. Okay. Uh, we should move on to the pezzo pretty soon. Um, okay, do you want to take, uh, I thought you could play this middle section with a little bit more forward energy. I know it's only pochissimo or something, pochissimo, uh, what is it? Po pochettino, pochettino piumoso. <laughs> it's a funny marking. Uh, but that's also another argument for maybe doing the beginning a little bit faster, but that's a whole other discussion. Uh, do you want to just go right there?
good. Very, very good. Very good. Okay, okay several small details. This was very good. One small detail is that I think it's quite nice if here. If you can really feel the end of that note connecting, it's quite hard because it's a full half note. And then rhythmically, especially here the second time, I would try to delay as much as possible. I think it's really exciting. Very breathless if you can uh, delay that. Okay, and then d one dynamic detail here. I would definitely crescendo more to that. I guess it's forzando or something, or for for yeah, it's forzando. Uh, and same thing. Yeah, I think that's a very nice dynamic there. You can join the piano. Um, okay, and then here, sorry, I'm just going rapid fire. Um, these, these are very interesting because, of course, you have to interlink with the piano, but I think actually your roles should be a little bit different. You're in dialogue, and I, th I find that the cello here should be much more impassioned, at least at the beginning, much more uh, unstable rhythmically. And actually, I can uh, make another uh, listening recommendation to you. There's a very rare recording of Gaspar Casado playing this piece. It's, it's the cello and orchestra version. Uh, have you heard the recording? Oh, it's, it's, it's amazing. So, I mean, most people don't even know Casado's recordings at all, but he was one of the greatest cellists who ever lived. And he does something so beautiful there. It's a kind of... It's just like, once you hear it, you'll never forget it, especially... Something he does with the the timing, the the sound, it just it blossoms. It's it's just like envelops you. It's so amazing. So really, go give it a listen. Whatever I tell you about it can't do it justice. So yeah, check that out. That's awesome. Um, and then all throughout, you know, the the feel the instability. And be a little more interruptive. Allow yourself to to egg the piano, the piano writing on. And then when you get here, that's where you can be a little bit more rhythmic. Okay, last detail about this section, then we'll move on to Pezzo Capriccio. So all this stuff, uh, and then you have three instances of the ta da 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 dum ta da 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 dum ta da dee da dum Different articulation on all of them. I think it's very interesting. So I don't know what you were gonna do, but uh, you can do kind of, a, and then I don't know. There are all sorts of things you can do, but feel that each of them it's the same rhythm, but an incredibly different uh, view on on that rhythm. Very very different feeling for each of them. Okay, and last, last, sorry, I know last, I said what last thing before, but this is actually the last thing, um, I hope. Uh, in the, you might, you might have, you probably have seen the, the, the yo-yo recording with Ozawa on YouTube. So here he does something so remarkable. He plays incredibly low. He plays. Go listen to it again. It's unbelievable, the, the intonation bending. So check it out, check it out. You could try that. It doesn't quite work as well with the piano as it does with the orchestra, but it's still a nice idea because the A, the B double flat, right? It's such a nice moment, yeah. Last, okay, this is really the last thing. Uh, there, the piano is the main voice, so accompany the piano. Be in in touch with them as you play the ta -di -da -da. and then it's you again. Okay, that really was the last thing. Uh, should we do the pezzo? <laughs>
Great job. <laughs> Wonderful. I can't tell you how many performances I've given of this piece where I missed the last harmonic. At some point, I just gave up on doing it as a harmonic. I started just doing... <laughs> so I would never miss it. <laughs> oh, man. Good times. I don't think I'll ever play this piece again. I'm no good at it. Uh, yeah, so wonderful. Really excellent, excellent. You know... It's just a very high level of playing. I don't really have much to add. Um, the only thing I would say is, um, I mean, it's not, it's almost not really even worth saying, but I have to say something because we still have 15 minutes left. So <laughs> um, 
I think that um, in a piece like this, which has so much um, um, emotional intensity, again, going back to the Bach, it's the complete opposite of the Bach, so much emotional intensity, it's very important to think about the way that you yourself work as an emotional human being. So um, when, when someone is upset, right, um, it's, it's very common for, you know, you, you have this feeling inside of you that's kind of swirling, right? And, you know, it go, comes in waves, right? Something you'll be like, like something, let's say you're in a conversation with someone and then they say something, let's say, you know, your mother or something, and she says something that just really irks you and you just, you just lash out, right? And then you're like, oh, I feel bad for what I just did. But the feeling is still there, right? So the way that human feelings, I think, work is that there always, there's, there's always this kind of underlying fog and it takes time for things to really change, right? Like it's pretty rare that if you're having a fight, just like one thing that someone else says will make you feel differently. Like if they say like, oh, you know, I'll give you a thousand dollars right now if you stop being upset. That's not gonna make you stop being upset, right? You can't just like turn it off and say like, oh yeah, I'm not upset anymore. I can go buy that thing that I wanted to buy. Um, you're still gonna have that feeling like, well, you know, I was you know, kind of upset about what happened, right? So. That's all to say that I think the best composers, and Tchaikovsky is definitely among them, uh, they understood this in the way that they wrote their music in the sense that when there's an emotional idea, they follow through with it till its end, until it feels like it makes sense for the emotional idea to, to, to finish, to have been completed. So um, all that's to say that as you interpret a piece like this, which especially, especially in this piece it has so much you know, it's kind of moving, and then it has these bursts, you know, you know all there's a... Uh, it grows, and then... It grows, and then it comes, and then, you know, and then... And there's not really any breaks, right? Everything is kind of going into one another. I would just map it out a little bit. Think a lot about how every note plays a role in the feeling of that exact moment in the music. And I think that, so, that's one part of it. The second part of it is using that knowledge from that feeling to then adjust your playing on a technical level. So, the, the kind of mystery, I guess, uh, the mystery of, for me, like when I see a great cellist, one of the things that just always makes me wonder, huh, you know, how, how is that even possible? is that it seems like a lot of things that they do uh, are just intuitive, right? But the fundamental truth is that the cello only speaks one language, the language of touch, right? It doesn't care whether you're angry. It doesn't care whether you're sad or happy inside. It only cares what you do with the bow on it, right? So somehow you have to find a way to translate whatever's going on here into, into, the, into the details here. And that's where the, the art comes in. That's art. I mean, that's really hard to do. And I think that part of it is kind of, part of it is kind of inspiration. And I think everyone is capable of it. And part of it, which not everyone is capable of because they don't put the work in, is the attention to detail that, that it requires. So really listening, understanding, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to make a decision here. I'm not going to accent this note, or I'm going to have a little bit slower vibrato here, or a little bit more pressure here to make this note a little more detailed, right? I think that's kind of, when we talk about adding more detail to playing, the great players, you hear them and you're like, wow, I, I really hear the detail, so clean, so polished, so many ideas that I can hear so clearly, right? So, that being said, um, I, again, I wasn't sure if that was worth even saying. But uh, do you want to just play a little bit more? Maybe, um, actually, let's take the beginning. Why not?
very good, very good. So there is one detail I will mention. I think it's very important. The build up to the top B was great. And you also did the top B amazingly. Bum, bum. I think you were totally right. The most intense moment is after the second piano chord. Fantastic. Here. You have this. Now. But now there's a rest, right? Am I right about that? I recall there being a rest. Uh, so I didn't hear that. I, I heard. What are we in? Rest. And then, so again, you want to feel the relationship. And then finally. And now you can, I think, diminuendo. Only for one bar. And then you have to crescendo again, right? But so I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't do a big diminuendo here because I feel that. That's that's the place where you want to go, right? So I would find a way to intensify intensify up until here. And of course, it's still intense, right? But anyway, big thing is a rest. Very intense uh, emotionally there. Uh, just try from. Uh... Nice. Good. Good. Be careful just at the end. The vibrato can be a little more measured, I think. Because for me, all this stuff is speech. It's not song yet, right? You're, there's, there's text kind of, you know. Uh, all this stuff, you're declaiming something very important. And then this uh, is like very important words. You're ending what you're saying. Is the most, you're making your point right at the end. So if you obscure it with too much vibrato, it sounds too much like you're singing. But you're saying something very important. Okay, why don't you start from... Uh, sorry to skip the, the piano solo, but... Uh, good excellent amazing really amazing playing fantastic um yeah only thing i would say sometimes the vibrato is a little too noticeable i think again going back to the perlman thing the vibrato really is like it should be like cornstarch in chinese food just the right amount you don't notice it too much you definitely notice it too little not enough texture in the food right but just the right amount uh, just the right amount is, is nice, uh, makes the dish perfect. Um, so yeah, the vibrato is kind of a part of the, it's kind of a part of the sound, I think. Um, I, I feel that it's like you're baking it in, like it's already there, you know, and you just need to find the way that it works perfectly with the sound that you're creating in the bow. But if you try to add it like salt, it will be uneven. You know, you need to have baked it in to the, the cookie whatever the sound, 
already. Um, yeah, and the only other thing is that all this stuff with the... I just think it can be a little bit more waves, waves of emotion. Feel really the, the quality, like at that point, again, speak, speak, don't just sing. Da -di -da -dum -ti -da -da. Every word, every note has a new word, basically, saying something very meaningful. Uh, yeah, but otherwise, amazing. Um, the very end of this section here, am I wrong? I'm not looking at the music, but am I wrong that there's a huge crescendo? Is that for Fortissimo or is the Fortissimo later? I can't remember. Ah, okay. Yeah, I was just confused because it seemed like you... I mean, what you did was nice. Uh, I mean, you don't really have to change it, but... Again, I think it's interesting at least to try, you know, really... Feel the crescendo there to that B flat, and then... And the gradually dying down until... Until you get to the... By the way, this middle section was amazing. It was really great, very in tune. Only thing I would say is that sometimes you might want to play a little closer to the bridge. Um, uh, because right now you're extremely clean. Kind of, kind of there, but... If you actually make it a little bit messier, what will happen is in a big hall, it will start to pop a little bit more. Because this sounds very good under the ear. This kind of playing here. But out there, it's kind of... Whereas if you play closer to the bridge, they can start to heal, hear all the notes, like uh, like real like uh, pings, like brass instrument. You know, kind of. And I would also experiment with uh, sometimes feeling the, the bounce here in the hand, and then sometimes feeling more in the forearm. Depends, you know, like a... I like to think of that's more like this, and then... Obvi obviously, all this stuff is very forearm heavy, but all, you know... Um... This is all here, right? So feeling basically just the different textures um, in, the, in the articulation. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think that's a good place to stop. Uh, really excellent playing, just very impressed, so... Wonderful, wonderful work. Thank you both. Yeah, take care. Thank you so much, Vladimir. It was amazing having you come tonight. I'm so glad this worked out. So, sure. thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, does anybody have any questions before we end, or are we good to go? I'm going to take that as a sign that we're good to go. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, reminder that we have our last faculty panel tomorrow at 11 a.m. So don't want to miss that one. Um, thank you so much, Vladimir. So nice to see you. Nice to have see you. Have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Good night. Bye, everyone.